All right, Alexander, let's talk about an article from Politico, which uh, made the claim that the Biden White House is uh, stopping all of uh, their weapons aid to Ukraine. Oh, roughly this is what this, the story was, uh, was saying. And then the White House came back and they made a statement saying, no, that's not true. We are not stopping our uh, funneling weapons to Ukraine. And then they gave a list as to all the, all the weapons aids all the weapons aid they have given to uh, Ukraine and how they support Ukraine and how they're going to arm Ukraine to the teeth. Okay, all of that stuff. Um, this is an interesting story because when Trump was president, we had a much different situation taking place with uh, with a fake news report, which is similar. And you're going to talk about that. And I also think it's an interesting story because not many people talk about the fact that you have the U.S. president, Joe Biden, who is also who was also at one time the uh, the shadow president of Ukraine, um, talking about these uh, these issues or, or dealing with this policy. I just find it really fascinating that here you have the person who was essentially running Ukraine under Obama, and make no mistake about it, he was the president of Ukraine. Poroshenko answered to him, um, and now he's the president of the United States. So I guess he's he's stepped up, but. Um, you know, is he losing interest in Ukraine? Is is Biden saying, you know what, now that Hunter has gone through the country and and taken everything that he had to take, I'm, I'm just not interested in Ukraine. Anyway, Alexander, get into this story. It's a very interesting story, actually, because let's first of all start with the Politico story and then let's look at the denials. What the Politico story actually says, if you drill into it carefully, is that in what the United States has actually frozen is a package of about $150 million of arms supplies, which was agreed in April uh, and has now been frozen. So the White House and the U.S. administration then came out and said, well, actually, you know, the story isn't true. We're still supporting Ukraine, just as we always have. Look at all the arms supplies we've provided. Look at all the aid you've supplied. But when you actually drill down into it very carefully, what you discover is that the Politico story actually is probably true. Because what they're actually saying is, well, we delivered all these things before. We're prepared to provide Ukraine with all this aid again. But this particular package that was agreed in April, we're going to put in something called the contingency <laughs> reserve so that if the situation turns bad, then we can deliver it. So in effect, if you actually think about it, if you think about what that really means, it means that Politico basically got it right. And these arms aren't going to be delivered to the Ukraine anytime soon. They're being held back. If there's more trouble on the eastern border, well, you know, they could be reactivated again. But then, of course, the United States is always in a position to reactivate arms deliveries to any country. It can send arms deliveries very, very quickly. So, in effect, that's what it's... That's what it's done. It's actually stopped this particular transfer of arms. You have to read the denials from the White House very carefully to see that. But they are what you might say denials that actually confirm the original story. Just making that point. The second point I'm going to make is that, of course, if we all take our minds back to the days of the Trump administration. Donald Trump was very sceptical about Ukraine, but his administration did change the policy. Obama had a policy of not supplying arms to Ukraine. Donald Trump reversed that, or at least his administration reversed that. And during the time of Donald Trump's administration, the United States did start supplying arms to Ukraine, doing so, by the way, against criticism from Germany, which is still opposed to arms supplies to Ukraine. So Trump changed the policy. And then in August 2019, we learned that there was supposed to, that the, you know, particular arms package that the Trump administration was supposed to be sending to Ukraine appeared to have been stopped. And there was a massive fuss. And the president, Donald Trump, was impeached because they said that he'd made or tried to reach a quid pro quo with uh, Zelensky to investigate his political opponents in the United States. And he'd frozen 
will stop the package in order to put pressure on Zelensky to agree to that. And of course, we went into great detail and we explained that this really wasn't true and that this whole idea of a quid pro quo was a complete misconception of what had really happened. Well, this time round, if you look at this, it's not exactly clear why the administration has frozen this arms package, but it may have been connected with the negotiations with the Russians to set up the Geneva summit, in which case, well, I wouldn't go so far as to call it a quid pro quo, but it's part of a deal done to Vladimir Putin to get him to come to Geneva. So just, 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 just making all these points, just to provide some context. I think it is absolutely clear, coming back to your last question, that the United States, I don't know about Biden himself, but the United States is losing interest in Ukraine. I think that they're coming, there's a growing realisation across some parts of the US government, not all of them, that Ukraine was a coup too far, that it was a territory far too deeply embedded within Russia, that it was undefendable, and that there would be a political crisis sooner or later if they didn't find some kind of a way of disengaging. They made it very clear in April that they were not prepared to fight for Ukraine. They've made it very clear at the latest summit meeting, the NATO summit meeting, that Ukraine is not going to join NATO anytime soon. And in fact, that means ever. And now they are quietly dialing down their military aid to Ukraine. And whilst they haven't yet got round to telling Ukraine that you've got to negotiate with Russia and with the people in the, sep the separatists in the East to come to a political settlement, I wouldn't be surprised if in a year or so that's going to happen. In the meantime, as we've discussed, and as was very clear from the Blinken um, um, Newland visit to Ukraine, which took place a few weeks ago, the United States is going to squeeze what's left of Ukraine out of it and all the things that happened and which Hunter Biden was involved in that's going to continue exactly as before. Probably it's going to escalate, though Hunter himself won't be involved. Right, so that's what, that was my question, is that um, you can look at Ukraine in, in two ways, on, in two, uh, two pillars. The one is is starting a war with Russia, the military side of things, um, you know, causing trouble underneath uh, Russia's underbelly and looking to destabilize Russia, which essentially the goal is to destabilize Putin and get a regime change in Russia. That yeah. has failed. That's been a complete and utter failure. Yes. The other pillar to look at, though, Absolutely. is the, uh, the financial pillaging of the country, which mm. I would say mm. was a success mm. and continues to be a success mm -hmm. to a certain extent, like you said, Blinken and Newland Absolutely. rolled into town just uh, just a month ago or so, and uh, they they basically told Ukraine, "Look, we're not done pillaging your country just yet. We need a little bit a little bit more time, so we're going to come and we're going to grab some more things on our way out." So they did their big pillaging when uh, Biden was president of Ukraine, and yes, Biden was president of Ukraine. <laughs> he was the shadow president of Ukraine. So they did a lot of pillaging then. Enrolled Hunter Biden. He came in. God knows what Hunter Biden did. Anyway, they, they took a lot of stuff. The European Union was also involved. No doubt about it. The IMF yeah. under Lagarde was mm -hmm. also involved. They took a lot of money. And, uh, and now they're just kind of, you know, going in every so often into the house and just taking more and more things. And uh, that's going to continue unless Ukraine wakes up. What does Ukraine need to just mm. freaking wake well, up, Ukraine? Wake up. Well, it's going to be very difficult because we know that there's all sorts of people in Ukraine who don't want to wake up and they're very angry. And some of them are very compromised because they've done all kinds of things and they would be afraid frankly, for themselves, if there was a shift in policy. And that's not to be discounted. Some of them, they quietly, before very long, start looking for exits to the West, to Canada, to United States, to wherever. But I think at the moment, they still want to stay. But I agree. I think that's all that's left is now uh, uh, the, the grand strategy, the grand geopolitical strategy um, of using Ukraine as a bridge to um, change things in Moscow, I think that has conclusively failed, exactly as you say. 
And I think now the, the whole story is try to get as much as you can on what's left and then go before the whole thing, the whole house of cards collapses. And I think that's exactly where we're going. By the way, the US is obviously there are people in the US. Maybe one shouldn't say the US, but there are people in the US who are playing that game. My impression is that whatever the US has done in that respect in Ukraine, you could m multiply that with Europeans by a multiple of about three. I mean, I think if you really want to know who has done most of the economic pillaging in Ukraine, I guess for every American, there's at least three Europeans and it's on a much bigger scale. But I was reading an assessment of the state of the Ukrainian economy. I'm talking about the real economy, not, you know, the sort of figures that get banded around, which are all based on uh, fake exchange rates and uh, um, adding in, you know, loan payments, which are then added to GDP. When you actually look at its industrial economy, it's, an, it's a wreck. Its shipbuilding industry, which is once the biggest in the Soviet Union, has gone. Its engine and, you know, it, turbines and all its big industrial plants in the east are now essentially lying idle. It's even been reduced, apparently, to exporting soil. You know, Ukraine has this extraordinary valuable black earth. They're apparently exporting that. So, I mean, it is in a terrible state. And there is really um, no, no sign of any change. And when the tap of IMF dollars is turned off, which at some point it's going to be, or the whole thing will just cr crumble in. And I, I, I would give this a few more years, perhaps, whilst people take what's left. And then who knows what will happen because Ukraine will at that point find itself with a bare cupboard and without yeah, friends. Um, they're exporting their own land. That tells you a lot. They're, they're actual, they're actual land. <laughs> they're actual Absolutely. land. They're shipping it off. That's, no, that's incredible. No. Um, Nord Stream 2 is not going to help the economic situation in Ukraine as well. Germany, that is Germany backstabbing. Ukraine, because Germany, and everyone gets this wrong, everyone gets this wrong, Germany wanted Nord Stream 2, not Russia, Germany wanted Nord Stream Absolutely. 2. So Germany yeah. has backstabbed Ukraine with Nord Stream 2. And this is after Alexander, and so many people get this wrong too, so many people. This is after the uh, European Union helped the coup along in Ukraine in 2014, because Many people forget, or many people just don't report, the fact that there was a deal in place for ha to have elections because of the disputes that were going on with Yanukovych. Putin mentioned this as well Absolutely. recently, and he set the record straight as well, but everyone gets this wrong. There was a deal in place to, uh, to have elections, I believe in December, because there were the protests on the streets and they broke a deal. They said, OK, let's just have elections and settle this the democratic way. And the EU, the EU backstabbed that deal. It was the EU that sabotaged that deal. So Absolutely. Europe has been much, much, much worse for Ukraine than, uh, than the U.S. could ever be. Oh, absolutely. The Europeans played the central role. I mean, it, it was the Europeans who uh, negotiated, who came up with this disastrous association agreement. Remember that? <laughs> Remember how that was going to transform Barroso Ukraine? At the time, it was Barroso, right? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Barroso, Barroso uh, uh, and Karl Bildt and Radek Sikorsky and all these awful people. But it was Barroso. It was Barroso's uh, commission. They came up with this terrible association agreement, terrible for Ukraine, that is, which, of course, has completely failed to turn the Ukrainian economy around. On the contrary, it's gone downhill ever since. And as you absolutely rightly said, they brokered, they mediated this deal for elections to take place in December 2014. And for the setting up, by the way, of an interim government to run the situation until then. And then a day later, <laughs> the day after this thing was signed, they colluded in what was essentially a coup, which overthrew the democratically elected president and landed us in the crisis in which we now are. So it, it, it was a, it was a terrible action by the EU. And 
far more than the United States, actually. Well, I say far more. I mean, they provided the diplomatic and legal framework for the disaster which was to come. If Germany and France, which was supposed to be the two countries that you know run the EU, Merkel, in other words, and Hollande, who was the French president, if they'd acted like real leaders, the Ukrainian crisis would never have happened. It was, in my opinion, Merkel's most disastrous legacy to Europe until the next ones, which were first the Greek crisis, and then the and then the migrant crisis a few a few uh, a, a year after that. So that gives you some idea of the disaster the EU wreaked upon that country. And by the way, the association agreement uh, provided the model for the uh, withdrawal agreement they negotiated with Theresa May, <laughs> which they were trying to get Britain to agree to. So that gives you some idea of, you know, the kind of people we're dealing yeah. with. Nord Stream 2, any comments there? How that's going to really... That's, it, things are just going to get worse. Oh, Nord Stream 2, well, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Things are going to get worse because that was the other thing. I mean, having engineered this crisis in Ukraine, <laughs> the, year, the, the same year that they did that, uh, um, they came along and they said to the Russians, we want this gas pipeline because we've closed down all our nuclear pipe power stations. We're closing down all our coal, coal mines. We need to keep it, keep on track with our carbon uh, commitments because, you know, Germany always can, you know, carries out its treaty obligations on climate change and we're the great leaders on this. So we need natural gas to make up the difference because without our nuclear power stations, we're going to have to use more coal and coal is extremely bad for the environment. More coal and more oil. So the Russians were very sceptical and they agreed. And that was the year after all this crisis began in Ukraine. And that's Nord Stream 2. And of course, Nord Stream 2 is deliberately created in order to divert gas flows from Ukraine across the Baltic to Germany. In other words, Germany itself cut Ukraine out. <laughs> it was an unbelievably cold-blooded and cynical move that the Germans made. And um, again, um, I think Ukraine at the time spoke, you know, wildly that this is like the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. <laughs> but I mean, which is a bit, a bit extreme. But you can understand their feelings because it pulled the rug underneath their entire economic future. It robbed them of all e leverage over the EU. It crashed their budget because, of course, they're at risk of losing the revenues from the transit of the gas that flows through um, pipelines that pass through Ukraine. And, of course, it exposes them in a terrible way if in the future they run into further problems in terms of energy and they have to rely on the Russians and the Russians decide to switch off the tap. Now, in theory, that can't happen anymore because the gas that they, that Ukraine is using is supposed to be European gas that re reverse flows. But everybody knows that it's actually Russian gas that they're siphoning off with the European Union's agreement. Uh, but, you know, once that stops, which it will, when Nord Stream 2 is done, they're absolutely stuck. They, you know, uh, 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 they're, they're up a creek and without a paddle, as the uh, British like to say. Real quick, does Ukraine, uh, if it continues on this trajectory, does it break apart? Not because of war, yeah, but because of economic be conditions. More I wouldn't, I would, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, the the eastern and southern regions, the Black Sea coast and the eastern regions are predominantly Russian speaking. The dominant party there until a few weeks, months ago, was a, a pro-Russian party that wants to see better relations with Russia. Uh, they have a very different perspective of things than people in Western Ukraine do. Um, so it's quite possible that at some point they could say enough's enough. We we are joining people in the Donbass. We're breaking away from Ukraine. We want to be separated from this situation. And then, of course, there's this large region in the center of Ukraine ar around Kiev, 
which is predominantly Ukrainian speaking, but orthodox, it was formerly part of the Russian Empire, formerly part of the Soviet Union, has always felt a certain pull back towards Russia. And they might say also, you know, we can't carry on like this. We want to break away too. We would we want to uh, uh, make arrangements with Russians. We don't feel as bitter and as hostile to the Russians as people further west do. And then you have Western Ukraine, which is viscerally and passionately anti-Russian and which could very well decide, well, you know, if Eastern Ukraine and Central Ukraine want to make up with Russia, we will break away and we will form our own state, which, by the way, they could do, and it would be a viable one. And perhaps that's what will happen. They better do something. I'm not saying break up, but they better do something as far as Ukraine as a state is concerned. No. Otherwise, they will break up because the trajectory on an economic level is just looking yeah. really, really It's bad. looking terrible. It's looking terrible. Now, can I just say, I mean, it's not something I would want to see at all. Not at all, not in any way. But I, like yourself, I can very well, very well see it happening. And one of the other things is that one gets a sense that ordinary Ukrainians understand this. They repeatedly elect leaders who come into power saying that they want to improve relations with Russia. Zelensky is only the latest. I mean, he was talking Russian to his, during his election campaign. He was giving every indication when he was elected that he wanted to improve relations with Russia. Then they're pulled towards an anti-Russian position by the viscerally anti-Russian uh, lobby within Kiev and in Western Ukraine. And that creates a situation of ever deeper crisis in Ukraine. But the point I suspect will come when unless this trajectory is reversed, the whole thing could fall apart and you could see the sort of submerged feelings that many Ukrainians have start to reassert themselves and reassert themselves in a very powerful way. But I don't think we're yet there yet. I think Ukraine still has... Uh, just enough time to turn things round. But will they do so? Is the political system in Ukraine capable of allowing that? Well, to be straightforward about it, I'm not convinced. I'm not sure. But we will see. The destiny, their fate is in their own hands. And perhaps that's an important thing to say. Ukraine is basically a rich country, very badly managed, but if it acts independently and in its own self-interests, um, then it can actually start to pull together and become a wealthy and prosperous and strong country in Eastern Europe. But in order to do that, it needs to understand that it, it, it's not going to have saviours in the EU and in the US. I mean, the US is far away and the EU has never saved anybody. So, uh, you know, Ukraine needs to start to think for itself and it needs to make realistic decisions about what it needs to do. And one of those is it needs to patch up relations with Russia. Yeah, they better get on it. Time is ticking. I agree. They, they yeah. can turn it around, but they Absolutely. better get yeah. moving. And they better get moving quick. Absolutely. No doubt about it. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, that is the video. Go to our uh, Odyssey Bitch Shoot Super U free speech video platform Super U pages. You'll find all of our videos, Alexander's, mine, and of course the Durant's. You'll find all the information in the description box down below. Take care.